All set. Great. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. And welcome everybody um, to the first SEA talk event of, of the year. Uh, Happy New Year to you all. Um, so what I, um, I'm going to just dive in really, because I'm going to do a lot of talking in the first hour, and then we'll open it up for lots of questions and things. What I do uh, recommend actually is, um, as we're not stopping on the way for questions, perhaps if you make any notes as you go, any questions that you, you have in particular, um, I think that that might just might just help um, help us talk about as much of the talk as possible, really. So um, I'm going to share my slides now, and I'm just going to go back to the screen I was sharing just a minute ago, where as people were joining. Um, and this is just uh, I just want you to take a moment just to look at the words on the screen and notice any emotional response you have to anything on there, and if you do. Um, maybe make a note of it. Uh, just write down any gut instinct you feel, any reaction, positive or negative. Um, maybe there's something that you wish was on there that isn't. Um, I kept looking at it and think, oh God, I didn't write this or I didn't write that. <laughs> so um, in the end, I realized, well, I have to make a call and just say, okay, that's enough. Um, but yeah, it would be good to hear because when we have a discussion at the end, it would be good to hear um, anything about other languages or other um, dialects, language varieties and so forth um, that maybe I haven't, um, I haven't talked about here. Um, so I'll just give you a, a, a couple more seconds just to have a look and maybe make any notes, first you know, three or four emotional responses that come into your mind. Okay, thank you. Makes for great recording, doesn't it, Paula? <laughs> so, so, um, so I'm going to um, go on to the next slide and um, just quickly introduce myself. Um, so I've got a background in uh, psychotherapy and coaching, and I also um, uh, did uh, linguistics as my first degree. So I'm very, very interested in languages. I'm a kind of language geek. Um, so apologies if if you know I, I go a bit too far into one subject, which you might think, okay, that'll do, that's enough. Uh, <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, and I'm also interest, inter, interested in the intersection between uh, linguistics, language generally, and of course, therapy and coaching, um, as Paula mentioned already, um, it's our key tool for our job, um, but also the intersection with diversity and inclusion, which has been very much at the forefront of the minds of a lot of us and in fact uh, last year's SEA conference was on that subject really um, and I've, I've done a lot of work in that area myself um, so I'm, I wanted to look at the, the crossover really between diversity and inclusion with language as well so um, that's, um, that's kind of the background to where I'm going with this. Um, for those of you on the call who may be, maybe this, you don't know so much about existentialism, it's one of those mysterious words which myself included, don't really know how to describe it. Um, but I thought I'd just try and explain it from this, uh, this point of view, uh, you know, in contrast with science. So I don't know if you're, you're familiar with this uh, model of Thomas Kuhn, uh, who talked about um, how science, the structure of science, scientific revolutions, talks about um, the idea that, that in science, you, you move from one paradigm to the next. And while you're in a stable paradigm, um, you, you kind of take for granted that that paradigm is, is fine uh, and you, you accept all the assumptions of that paradigm and you build knowledge uh, based on that paradigm. And that's what um, Kuhn calls normal science. And that's most of science takes place during that period. Um, and then perhaps at some point, um, anomalies start to get found, um, some data which seems to contradict the paradigm uh, brings about a crisis. Um, we could say an existential crisis, actually. Um, and if there are enough anomalies with a particular paradigm, you may all come crashing down and a revolution takes place and you have a new paradigm, uh, which may be dramatically different from the previous one, takes its place. And then once again, normal science proceeds based on these new uh, underpinnings, these new assumptions. Um, 
So that's all good and well. Um, that's a, a scientific uh, model, which I think you know, it seems to hold weight for me. Um, but what we do in, in existentialism often is actually, rather than base everything on a paradigm, we actually examine the paradigm itself and explore what are the actual assumptions of the paradigm, uh, both conscious and unconscious ones as well, because we do have certain assumptions that we're perfectly familiar with and we'll call them out and so forth. But there are oftentimes uh, assumptions that we have which don't re we're not really aware of. We just kind of uh, didn't really realize they're there. So hopefully for those of you new newer to existentialism, that, that's a little bit of a, a flavor of it. Um, those of you who are familiar with it will think, well, that doesn't explain existentialism entirely in any way at all, but that's also true. Anyway, so uh, next slide. So the today's paradigm that I want to explore is uh, language variation. Uh, and so, in, especially with this backdrop of diversity and inclusion, I'm quite uh, keen to consider what are our attitudes to language um, and, how it, and how it comes about, what it is exactly, and what it means for us uh, to have language and how it operates. Um, and I've written down here some probably quite common assumptions, which over the years, um, you know, I've experienced both uh, through my uh, studies and also just anecdotally in everyday life. Um, but these are kind of uh, assumptions um, that often are quite open and sometimes people don't really realize they've got them. So I'm just going to pick out a, a, a few of these from the list, one being that kind of language is set in stone, you know, we, we have a way of speaking and uh, we kind of get annoyed if, if somebody changed it. You know, we, we often get very upset when people speak differently to what we're used to, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, I mean, I include myself, if I hear my son speaking in a way in the latest vernacular, I think I, it kind of gets my back up, right? I think uh, it, it, it's unsettling for me for some reason. Um, and we have this idea, it's very common across the world, the idea of some correct way of speaking, and then lots and lots of incorrect ways of speaking, which we look down on and we stigmatize and we think, um, you know, this is a terrible thing. Uh, we talk about nice languages and ugly languages um, quite happily uh, without any <laughs> second thought. Uh, and, we th and sometimes people say, oh, yes, this is a very expressive language or this language is deficient. Um, uh, we also think that we, our, perhaps our own language doesn't change at all, that I speak one way, the way I speak is the correct way, and, um, and it never changes. Um, and any changes that we do notice in language, we often think of them negatively, like it's a sign of decay of the language in some way. Um, and, and another point here, a word ha in, has a meaning in and of itself in isolation. So we get annoyed about the use of a word in a different way uh, as well, um, uh, as if you know, words are kind of sacrosanct in that sense. So these are the, these are the, um, the sacred beliefs that I want to challenge today. Uh, I'm not saying they're all right or wrong. I just want to make us more aware of them. Um, and that's, um, that's where I'm going with this. So on to the next slide. Um, Firstly, this really challenges the first idea that language is set in stone. Well, if we have a look at uh, English and we look at the spelling of English, this is a clue <laughs> that English wasn't always pronounced the way uh, it's it, the, the way um, it, it was in the past. Because if we look at the spelling, we know that the spelling reflects uh, the way it was pronounced in the past. So um, take an, a, a word like night, uh, the G and the H are not pronounced at all. Are they in there for fun? No, they're not. They, were, they used to be pronounced in, in older versions of English, a bit similar to the German uh, ch sound in Nacht, or um, even in um, uh, Scottish nicht as well. And also the, 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 the I sound used to be pronounced nicht, uh, and nowadays it's pronounced night. So um, that's a vowel change. Um, and this was a big change in English actually around you know, in the Middle Ages really. Uh, 15th, 16th centuries, um, a great vowel shift, shift where all the vowels changed uh, kind of uh, with the, 
the sound going one up. If you, if you, if you know about phonetics, the vowels are based on the, you know, where your tongue is lying in your mouth. And so vowels got higher and higher and the highest vowels became what's called a diphthong. So E became I, so two vowel sounds together. Um, that didn't happen in all, uh, all parts of, the, of England or all parts of the English speaking world. In, in Scotland, uh, that change didn't happen. Uh, it also didn't happen in, say, Geordie uh, dialect, which is in, in Newcastle. Um, so this is a first, a first quick snapshot that um, language changes. Uh, we kind of know it, but we kind of forget it, I think. Um, what I'm interested in here, if we look at um, diff uh, different snapshots of English through time, uh, and you know, the title of this talk is Continuum. If you look at the the gradual continuum from one English to the next. Um, you know, the, the 10th century from Beowulf, looking at that, that doesn't look like the language I speak at all. That's looked like a different language. Um, and then the 14th century, I can see, yeah, that looks kind of like English, but maybe it's like a, a dialect of English or something like that. Uh, it looks different to me. Uh, and then the 17th century, yeah, it's kind of like English, a bit weird. And then the 19th century one, it looks like modern English. Um, and, uh, and you can see that, that change going the way through. And that's a continuum that happened gradually, obviously. We, we, these changes happen very gradually without us even realizing. Um, and another point on the modern English one, even though everything there looks like modern English, the other question is, well, do the words mean exactly the same thing as they mean now anyway? You know, when Jane Austen White writes about um, a wife or a neighborhood or anything, does she have the same things in her mind as we had? Probably not, you know. So um, even when we have words that, that look the same, uh, it doesn't mean they mean the same to everybody. Um, and this is obviously the case with, with English. We know we know plenty of words in modern day usage, which used to mean something else 50 or 100 years ago. So um, that's the first point. Language uh, changes through time. Um, so that's the first continuum, changing through time. The second one is through space. So language changes not only through time, but through space. So let's take Latin as an example, which obviously changed through time as well, uh, but it also cha changed through space. We like to think of um, Latin as this uh, kind of very high status language. Um, and uh, where did it go? It, did it die? Well, it didn't really die. It just kind of um, morphed into other things. Um, and Latin is a great example uh, where to study language change because Latin was still used in very formal circumstances long after it was a, ever a spoken language in every in everyday life. Um, you know, it was used in the church, it was used in law and, and so forth. Um, so you could see that uh, divergence of kind of written Latin from spoken Latin. Um, and it became all these different languages uh, around Europe. Um, so that the Romans were very successful at wiping out other languages. Um, there are very few pockets where the Romans uh, went to uh, where Latin didn't stay. Um, so if we look at this uh, Latin language map, we can see these are the main Latin languages today. Um, five of them, it looks like, right? Very nice and neat. Um, and so is it, is it really so neat as that? Um, perhaps, we, um, perhaps we thought that one day People were speaking Latin on the Sunday night, then on the Monday morning they switched over. Um, but the nation state view actually does inhibit our understanding of language. I think it, it kind of, it kind of, what's the word? It, it helps us forget all the different varieties of language, I think. Um, this is another view of the Latin languages around Europe. And you can see that there are lots of different, different varieties of language all the way through, all across Italy, all across Spain, Portugal, France, uh, and, and Roma Romania, all these slightly different languages. Um, and in fact, in, in Spain, uh, it's kind of not normal to call their language Spanish. They tend to call it Castilian. 
precisely because it's the language spoken in that one region. Um, obviously, it's spoken all over Spain, but that's where it's from, uh, Castile. Uh, and so Spanish tend to say Castellano instead of Espanol, uh, because there are other languages such as Catalan and Galician and so on. Um, in Italy, the, uh, the standard language came from uh, the Tuscan, Tuscan language. Uh, and that happened during the, you know, the Renaissance and uh, great writers uh, such as D Dante and people basically elevated the Tuscan language, which is the basis of modern standard Italian now. And in France, there were two key languages, one for the north half and one for the south half. And the north half won, basically, when it came to deciding uh, which one became the, the national language. So if we look at these um, languages online, you can see that they're kind of gradually changing one to the other. If you look, um, so Galician is similar to Castilian, Castilian is similar to Catalan, Catalan is actually very similar to Occitan and so forth uh, as you go, uh, go through space. Um, so that's the, um, that's the second continuum you've got a language changing through time, language changing through space. Now, as Paola recommended, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a bit just to talk about the next bit. So the question is, um, you know, what, what's the difference between a language and a dialect? Um, this is a, an interesting question. Um, and people often, <laughs> when I ask this to people, people often don't have a, a very clear answer. Um, I think people generally have an idea that a language is somehow better than a dialect, or a dialect is somehow some kind of spin-off of the, of the main language. Um, generally, the word dialect is, is considered quite negative, um, and it's even used as a kind of put-down for, for a way of speaking um, that is not the, 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 main, the main language. And then a lot of stigma arises uh, around that. Um, so I want you, I mean, I'll be interested in the discussion later on to hear people's thoughts about dialects. Um, now maybe you've had experience of dialects, maybe you spoke a dialect yourself that you've had to not speak in order to fit in or something like that. Um, maybe you've um, denigrated the dialects of others. I know I have done as a child, definitely done that. Um, so it would be interesting to talk about that um, at the end. Um, so the question is, what does make something a language rather than dialect? So that's, that's the question I put to you. So what I would say, um, I'm, I know I'm not sharing my screen, but I'm going to move forward anyway, uh, is really the definition of a different language um, you know, is, is when it's no longer intelligible with another one. That's a simple answer, right? If something's mutually intelligible, then you must be speaking the same language. So if I speak to somebody in New York, uh, that person doesn't speak the same as me, but I understand that person, that person understands me. So therefore uh, it must be the same language. Um, the question is, is it, so, is it as clear cut as that? Um, do we really have such an easy way of uh, distinguishing between these things? So I'm going to share my screen again, just to bring up this map, which is actually very similar, I'm told, to uh, uh, Darwin's um, map of uh, species, the difference between species. There's a, there's, a, there's a gradual, it's not clear cut, there's a gradual moving away uh, from one language from another. You have very high mutual intelligibility between dialects that are close together, and then you move out gradually until you've got you know, some kind of understanding between uh, two, two dialects which are very far apart. Um, so what, what I love is, um, as a language geek, what I spend my time doing is, <laughs> you can see on YouTube people actually testing out these mutual intelligibilities between similar languages. Um, so in this case, you've got Occitan, Catalan, French, and Italian. And what, I, what is uh, instructive as a therapist or a coach really is the way they go about trying to understand each other. So 
because they they declared that they speak different languages up front, but they're going to speak in their own language and see if they understand each other. But they assume that they speak a different language and therefore they make a special effort to understand what what each other is saying. They don't assume that they know the meaning of the words that they're hearing. Uh, they're much more careful about it. And this really struck me as um, a very valuable tool uh, in, in therapy and uh, in, in coaching generally, uh, or any active listening exercise where you're, you're listening to somebody, is perhaps we should treat it like this. We should think of it as, okay, I'm speaking one way of, uh, one way of, I'm speaking one language variety and this person's speaking another. And uh, I can't assume that we mean the same thing. And I really have to work hard to, to figure out what they're actually saying. So this was um, a real, um, real eye opener for me, actually. Um, and you can, you can see these on, on online if, if you're that way inclined, see how they communicate with each other. Really fascinating. So I think there's, there's a lesson in that. Um, you don't have to be speaking a different uh, language uh, to, to, to be listening in that same way. You know, I could be speaking in, a, in what is apparently the same language, but then still take that same stance. Uh, and I think that would make us better listeners. So going back to the dialect point, um, it really is a socio-political thing. Um, this is a Yiddish scholar. So it's basically a language is, is a dialect with an army and a navy. So it, it tells you everything you need to know about the difference. It's got nothing to do with uh, one form of a language being inferior to another in any kind of linguistic sense. It's socio-political. So uh, you will have a dominant language variety which um, gets, gets a high, high dose of prestige. And we've seen pl there are plenty of research to show that those who speak a high prestige language get basically treated better. Um, we tend to um, think of people who speak the main, the, the prestige language as more intelligent, as more capable and so forth. Um, this is a Yiddish scholar. So obviously Yiddish was often considered like a dialect of German, um, but it's, it's a different language. It's similar to German. Um, and they actually use the um, uh, Hebrew uh, writing system for it. Um, but it's, that's not really what makes it different. What makes it different is it's slightly different. It uses more uh, Hebrew words and so forth. And it's got a lot of Slavic words in it. Uh, but it's not a dialect of German. Perhaps they have common ancestry in some sense. Um, so I think this is an important thing to remember when we think about uh, the way people speak. Um, uh, and to consider the, the stigmas and the, the prejudices we may have uh, when we hear, hear somebody. Um, what, another example here is of, of um, Hindi and Urdu, which have got different writing systems, a bit like German and Yiddish, um, but they're in spoken terms, they're identical. So um, Hindi and Urdu speakers will ha perfectly have a conversation um, and they will mix kind of Urdu words and Hindi words at, at will. Uh, when it comes to more formal writings, then Urdu tends to take vocabulary from Persian, whereas Hin Hindi tends to take words from Sanskrit. Um, but in everyday language, they, they kind of mix the two. So the only real difference to call out is, is the, the way they write. Um, and it's kind of, a, it's a good way to get, get prestige for the, the language variety that you speak. I, I would just, yeah, wonder what would happen uh, to uh, Urdu speakers if they didn't have their own writing system, uh, whether they would be seen as some, somehow kind of speaking an inferior form of, of Hindi, um, which guess what is exactly the, what happens with Scots. Um, Scots is a, a language which I think I've, what I've found is that even in Scotland, people often don't really think of Scots as a language in and of itself, they might think it's just bad English or just English with a Scottish accent or, or something like that. But actually, if you look at um, uh, the writings of Robert Burns, it's, it's a different language. It's very, very closely related to English, but it's different. Um, so in Scotland, you do actually have, actually have three languages, Scottish English, Scottish Standard English, which is what we normally hear 
So if a Scottish politician is speaking, that's what that's what you'll hear them speaking. Scottish Gaelic, which is of course a Celtic language uh, related to Irish and Welsh and Cornish. Um, and then Scots, which is a, a sister language of, of, of modern English. Um, and they have very sim similar histories. Um, you know, modern Scots and modern English both had influence from Old Norse and from Norman French, but they had different levels of influence. And that explains the difference between the two. So the Southern, uh, southern uh, language varieties had much more Norman influence and the, the uh, Scottish ones had more uh, Old Norse influence. So um, what I've, I've mentioned down here is something about a mesolect, which we're gonna talk, talk about in a bit. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward. Um, I'm going to skip past this because it's, it's saying a similar thing in the interest of time and just talk about really the, the standardization of, of language. So basically, you know, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, are considered separate languages, even though they're kind of mutually intelligible. But even amongst those, a standard gets chosen. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, and it's that, that stamp of officialdom, which makes something a, considered to be a language rather than a dialect. So pigeons and creoles, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing again, just for a bit of variety. Um, so pigeons and, and creoles are a very fascinating thing. And again, this is interesting from the point of view of diversity and inclusion, because pigeon languages came about, I mean, they, they've happened all through history, but there was a real prevalence of them during colonial times and slavery times. Um, and a pigeon language is basically a language that has no native speakers, but is kind of uh, an improvised way of communication between uh, a group of people who've been thrown together who don't speak the same language. And, and in fact, um, you know, slaves were often deliberately mixed up from their uh, original language groups to make it harder for them to communicate with each other. Uh, and, the, and also they had to uh, communicate with their masters in sort of you know, the best way they could in what they could, you know, just listening to English. Um, of course, they would have no means of writing. They had no chance to learn English. They were just supposed to understand by people barking at them, basically. So though that's the context that a lot of pidgin languages came into being. Um, and then what is incredible, actually, is what happens if, if a pidgin language persists and then you get another generation of speakers, um, speaking that pidgin language. And what happens is the children of a pidgin speaking community actually generate a, a fully fledged language out of it. Um, so that, and that's called a Creole. Uh, and so for me, this is one of the most fascinating things. Um, so a Creole is a fully fledged, fully functioning language that has developed out of a pidgin. And it's usually because of, um, uh, the, the next generation children growing and basically this tells us really you know languages are generated by children and each generation they they regenerate it and that that would explain a lot of the change that happens in language because it's each generation has to learn the language all over again effectively um, I mean one argument is to, is to say it's actually incredible that language stays so stable um, you know the fact that I can read Jane Austen who you know, was alive, whatever it was, 200 years ago. I've never met her, never met anyone that she ever met, uh, but I can still read her work and understand it is actually quite incredible when you think about it. Um, but Creoles are a real eye opener in this, in this regard and just the human capacity for communication. Um, and one story which is even more incredible than that is, um, it isn't just with spoken language. It also, the same phenomenon occurs with sign language. Um, and this was, uh, there was a famous uh, discovery in Nicaragua um, during the Sandinista revolution. There had been before that deaf people had never had any organized uh, schooling um, that catered for them in any way. Um, but then at the end of the seventies, there were these deaf schools, specialist deaf schools put together 
Um, and the schools tried to communicate with them using lip reading, trying to get them to speak Spanish and so on. And it absolutely failed <laughs> completely. But what happened outside of the schoolroom was that, you know, on the bus or walking to and from school is that the kids were spontaneously signing uh, with each other. Uh, and so it was this exactly the same pattern was seen. So the first uh, uh, years, the earlier years of the um, deaf children were basically signing in pigeon signing, uh, but then the younger ones coming through developed that into a, a fully fledged uh, sign language with full grammar and tense and all the rest of it. So um, that's pretty incredible. And I think that kind of, for me, that tells me, well, that's, you know, where is the source of language? The source of language is, is kind of a, a communal collaborative experience. It's not some kind of, I think we may be often tricked into thinking it's some kind of top down thing that people decide on this is how you speak. And there's a standard, you know, and lots of countries actually have a, an official organization kind of referee or policing uh, language. Uh, you know, the Fr France has it and Spain has it for sure. Um, a Royal Academy of, not a Royal, not, um, in Spain it's a Royal Academy, in, in France it's not a Royal one, but, um, but you get the idea. Um, so this is a real, a real uh, eye-opener for me, uh, how language comes, comes about from the bottom up. So that's uh, Creoles. Um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I'm going to move forward to yes so i'm going to share my screen again give me a moment so the problem um the problem with uh dialects and the prestige language um it's well it's not always a problem but let, let's just call it out as a as a thing anyway um is the status so this is the third continuum we're going to talk about the status continuum um share my screen um, and this is, uh, this is what linguists call a, a sort of a status ladder. Um, so the, the prestige language they call the acrolect. Uh, the low class language would be considered the basilect. And then the mesolect is in between where you kind of mix your low status one with a high status one, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unconsciously, actually. Um, um, and what's interesting is, um, Often it could be like a, a local dialect mixed with a, a standard. So imagine somebody from Yorkshire might speak kind of might broad Yorkshire uh, with their friends. And then in maybe um, if they're having a more formal situation, they might mix that with a more standard uh, English. Uh, so that's a typical example. Um, but it doesn't, the, the basilic doesn't have to be from the same language as the, as the acrolect. It can be a mix. Um, between different different languages, even um, which which happens a lot. In in the case of uh, Jamaican, um, okay, yes, yeah. Jamaican um, patois. So Jamaican patois is one of these creoles which came out of the um, slavery, of course, um, and is often considered an utterly debased way of speaking. That it's kind of bad English. Um, you know, if you're speaking in Cre uh, Creole or Patois, um, it's not considered high status at all. Um, and if you listen to Patois, um, you know, somebody speaking broad Patois as an English speaker, you will probably not understand any of it. <laughs> I mean, you might pick up the odd word, uh, but then you will often hear Jamaican speakers mixing Patois with uh, standard English and you get a kind of mixture and you kind of think, oh, this is nice. Jamaican, I kind of get it. There's a few words I don't get. And then you'll hear standard Jamaican English, which just uh, is completely uh, mutually intelligible with, we say, British English or American English. Uh, and you can kind of hear a Jamaican accent, maybe. Um, but it's um, in terms of its structure and everything, it's ex exactly the same, pretty much, as British or American English or something like that. Um, and um, you, know, you know, it's not that uh, out, only outsiders who see um, patois is low status, you know, Jamaicans themselves will see it as a, a sign of, you know, low social mobility. So there's a real stigma around these things when in fact these are perfectly fully fledged 
languages in their own right. Uh, and they express a culture uh, and a meaning of their own, a history and, and so forth. Uh, and so I think it's a real, um, a real shame, real a shame is a bit of an understatement, uh, that they're considered in such an inferior way. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna, that's just an example. You can look at this slide afterwards. A gradual change from Jamaican Patois all the way up to standard Jamaican English. Um, with a gradual mixture of the of the two languages all the way up. So the last area, um, really, and this is kind of connected with uh, the, the status of the language variety that you speak, is code switching. Um, and so this challenges the idea that we only ever speak in one way, which we don't. I mean, how, how often do we, you know, if you're in the pub with your mates, you speak one way, and then if you speak to your mum on the phone, <laughs> you have to speak a different way. If you speak to your boss at work, you'll speak another way again. Um, so we're all very uh, adept at switching between uh, styles of language or different registers, uh, it's sometimes called. Um, but there, there, there is an issue here in, in sometimes where people feel that they have to switch code um, to avoid um, kind of discrimination. Uh, and this happens a lot with um, African Americans whose um, you know, black American English as it's, it's called um, has got really low status uh, in America. And there's lots of research to show that um, it basically will cost you um, your employment chances if you speak like that. And so uh, people have to kind of lose the way they speak in order to get anywhere and this is common all, all over the world right i mean anyone in britain with a regional accent will probably feel a similar experience and i'd love to hear um people's experiences on, on the call actually uh, um if anyone's willing to share um so these are these are all different uh ways of language variation uh, i'm just going to summarize um through through time through space, through status, and then you've got uh, code or register. We've got a good example of um, the, one of the latest dialects that has come into existence, which is multicultural London English, as it's called, which wasn't in existence when I was young. Uh, but now um, it's basically a new dialect, and every child in London seems to know how to speak it. Um, so I don't know if you've, any, any of you on the call have heard it, but I've heard, so I heard my son use it. Um, and it, I, I, got, I used to get my back up, but then I realized, hang on, get with it. I'm doing a talk on this stuff. <laughs> so I shouldn't uh, get so cross about it. Um, so what I'm, I'm just gonna, um, before we go into a discussion, uh, I'm going to uh, just think about what, what sort of things we might uh, consider you know, for, for a discussion, you know, language uh, and its um, connection with our identity, uh, the context that we're in. And uh, an interesting question for me is, you know, when, we, when we're in therapy, as the therapist, uh, what effect does the, the kind of uh, language that we use uh, have on the client? You know, are we speaking very formally? Do we speak in kind of psycho babble do we speak in a matey way you know all these things um be interesting to consider you know that the impact that the way we speak may have on 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 the client and to what extent they would feel uh like opening up to us or feel a dis distance from us um um we've got to think about the history and and the the roots of you know what you, your language tells us i mean something like when i see read you know when i hear about patois or Scots, I think about the, the history behind it, and you know, to be ashamed of that is 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 pretty sad. Um, so that seems in itself to be an interesting topic. Uh, you know, for, could be for therapy or, or, or otherwise. Uh, and then, the, then then the perceived status of of people based on the way they speak. Um, uh, and another very interesting one, um, and very common in somewhere like London, is you know bilingualism, multilingualism, um, you know, what, what is it like as a client to be having therapy in, in not your mother tongue, not in your uh, first language, or indeed as the therapist? Um, are, are you practicing in a language 
different to you. I don't know. Um, Paola and, and Serena uh, did a, a talk on this uh, last year, which is really uh, fascinating. Um, and um, and, and code switching again within the language. You know, do, let's think about. You know, does this happen in the therapy room? And when does it happen? Why does it happen? What's uh, what topics do people feel comfortable expressing? I think people um, often say that in their first language they can express more kind of emotional things, and in the second language maybe more professional, business-like things. You know, it, I mean, obviously it, it varies, but this is a typical thing that you hear. Um, and I've put one at the bottom here, is monolingual mindset the cause of Brexit? There are articles about it, so I'd like to hear about that as well. Because <laughs> uh, um, actually, uh, Britain is um, pretty low on the bilingual scale. Um, globally, there are more bilingual speakers than monolingual speakers, but it's the opposite in, in the UK. You're probably not surprised to hear that, but anyway, it's worth calling out. Um, so what are the implications for therapy? Um, I, I basically said all this already, so I'm not going to go over it again. Um, except the last two points, really. Um, you know, what are what, what are the benefits of, of of kind of speaking the same language as, as our client, and as opposed to speaking a different uh, language to our client? I, I wonder, is there any um, any chance to open up different perspectives by speaking a different language? Um, I know certainly from my own experience that when I'm speaking another language, I my character is a little bit different. So, and I feel more comfortable saying certain things. So it's, that's an interesting area of, of, of discussion as well. Um, and then there's the question of the stigma. So if we consider our own opinions about language, um, what, you know, what do we, you know, what, what, how does that impact? You know, do we have our own kind of negative biases about language? Um, do we see people in a lower light, consciously or unconsciously? Um, so those are the questions we'll have. To go back to the, the, the beginning of the, the, the paradigm I talked about, um, I wonder if anything that I've gone through today has changed your opinion on any anything in terms of um, you know, nice languages, ugly languages, expressive languages, language being set in stone or changes to language being a sign of decay. I wonder if any of those, if they were true before, are no longer true now. Um, I'm going to open it up for discussion now. Thank you very much. <laughs>